Hi, my name is Rich Bass. I'm one of the flight paramedics here at Lehigh Valley Medevac. And today we're going to be talking about our safety process here with our program. I based this whole uh, lecture based on the SMS system, safety management systems. Um, it's one of the newer FAA guidelines that they're uh, kind of pushing on all the, uh, especially the air medical and even just uh, air certificate holders ac uh, across the country. Uh, air methods, uh, the people we're partnered with to provide the, at least the air part of the service and actually our ground service um, was one of the first ones in the country to fully implement this system. So I thought, well, I'll just uh, base the whole program on the SMS system and how it fits in. So there's four, quote, pillars to SMS, and that's policy, and that's basically the structured framework to define the objectives, assign accountability for your safety program, and also to uh, allocate resources for your safety in your program. There's risk management. Uh, it's a process to make decisions about hazards and risks based on operational environments, um, identifying hazardous conditions, and developing and implementing hazard controls or what some people might call mitigating um, some of your hazards. And then there's safety assurance. Uh, that's monitoring, measuring your safety performance. It's almost like a QA thing. Um, and you want to be continuously improving the level of safety performance, which kind of goes hand in hand with the quality assurance, quality improvement thing. Um, safety promotion, and it's a means of communicating clearly with an organization's personnel, ensuring they are trained to perform their roles in the safety system. So once again, the safety management systems, um, we're gonna look at policy, risk management, safety awareness, and safety promotion, and how all our tools kind of fit into this system. Um, a good place to start would be our general safety documents for both air and ground. Um, you can always find the updated copies in the EMS charts or wherever our document warehouse ends up lying. Uh, there's, there's a chance it might move out of EMS charts or you know somewhere down the road we could always go to a different charting format. So um, this is actually pretty important. This is kind of the nuts and bolts for everybody that works here at uh, Lehigh Valley Medevac, whether you're on the ambulances, the aircraft. Um, this is some of the things we really want people to pay attention to. Um, I went ahead and put the purpose, this is actually right, the, the preface for the whole uh, general safety document. It's to establish safety guidelines and practices that applies to medical crew members of LVHN Medevac or LVH Medevac. Um, the policies and procedures listed in the ground, or excuse me, general operations manual of the air service provider will have more authority than those listed in this document if there is some type of conflict. And we'll talk a little bit more about the General Operations Manual of Air Methods or otherwise known as the GOM. You'll hear people referring to it as the GOM. Um, this document's reviewed and amended as needed by the uh, Medevac Safety Council during the first Safety Council meeting of the calendar year. And that's in collaboration with the Medevac management team. And we also, at, at our Safety Council meetings, we usually have our... Uh, program aviation um, director, essentially our lead pilot, um, and usually our uh, one of the lead mechanics uh, sit in our safety council uh, meetings also, and they have input on this. So we'll start off with our general safety document. This mainly pertains to the air side of things. Might seem a little dry at times, but I think um, for somebody that's starting out with our program, this is stuff you need to know. Um, the pilot in command, you'll hear sometimes referred to as the PIC, is the final authority for the safety of the flight and the selection of the landing zones, continuing or canceling a flight due to weather, the, the loading and unloading of equipment or people, and basically any operation around the aircraft. The only exception to this, the pilot in command thing, having the final authority is us as crew members, if we're on the flight, we all have the option to say no. So anybody out of the three normal crew members, the pilot, the nurse, the paramedic, any one of us at any time can decline a mission. 
Um, it's one of those safety things that's built in there, and it wasn't always that way here, and it certainly wasn't always that way in the, in the industry. Um, number two, all crew members assigned to the flight will perform a safety walk around prior to the flight. That means if you're on the crew, you're on the aircraft, before that, air, you know, you get a mission, before you take off, everybody needs to be walking around the aircraft. You're looking for loose latches, make sure your doors are closed, or these ones are supposed to be so far. Um, make sure there's nothing laying around on the ground either that, that might get blown around as a hazard or even get sucked in uh, towards the aircraft. Uh, three, the flight crew members will assist in observing for air traffic and generally observing and reporting possible hazards during flight, during takeoff, landings, and taxiing. Um, especially more important when we're landing, especially when we're landing at uh, non-designated LZs, which is still about half of our business. You know, we're looking for wires, poles, trees, all types of stuff. Um, we need to be paying attention if we're at a busy airport. You know, we need to keep our eyes out at the window as best we can. Uh, medical crew will remain strapped in the seat belts until the uh, pilot states they may clear the aircraft. Additionally, the medical crew will announce over the ICS anytime time they're clearing from a running aircraft. So usually they'll throttle down the engine some, and then the, the pilot will say, you guys can clear. That's where they're laying back at the base, at the hospital with a patient, at an LZ. And it's also a good idea as you're getting ready to leave the aircraft, especially if you're not leaving right away, just to mention, hey, I'm, I'm stepping out now as you're leaving the aircraft, just as you unplug your, uh, your headset or your helmet, essentially. Um, number five, the, the medical flight team will remain in seat belts with shoulder harness in place during takeoffs, landings, and whenever patient care permits. Um, during takeoffs and landings, when we're in our final approach for somewhere, we should be in our belts. Um, it is perfectly fine and legal to be out of our belts when we're in straight and level flight, especially when we need to you know, do something with the patient, but we should be announcing that. And uh, if we're not doing something that needs us out of the belts, we should be in it. Uh, medical criminals notify the pilot when they are becoming unsecured from their seat belts. It kind of goes hand in hand with the last one. And then also notify the pilot again when they're back in their seat belt. And the reason that's important is we might be going on a ridge line where it's kind of windy or something like that, and the pilots say, you know what, you might want to hold off for a minute or two because it's going to get real bumpy just for a little while. Um, so you need to communicate. They need to be aware. Um, all flight crew will have their helmets with chin straps applied um, when they're in the aircraft or around a running aircraft. Risers will be down while occupying the co-pilot seat and around the aircraft that is running. Um, the only exception is when you don't have your visor down. Maybe when you're in the back, if you need to have it up to do something, it's probably a good idea to leave it in anyhow, or leave your visor, your clear visor down even when you're in the back, even at night. And the only exception to this is when we're using our night vision goggles. Um, it's next, I don't want to say impossible, it's next to impossible to have your clear shield down with the goggles, uh, with most of the helmets. And there's more benefit of using your goggles than having your, your your face shield down. Um, the reason we we like to, ha or we actually expect to have everybody have their face shields down, um, even at night, the clear ones, especially when they're up front, uh, is for bird strikes. Uh, we've had some pretty serious bird strikes over the years. About seven years ago, we had a very serious one, and if they wouldn't have their helmets on with their with their um, face shields down, the pilot and the person up front. Uh, would have sustained more injuries than the minor ones I think they did, or maybe not at all. Um, but it, it really it really kept their eyes safe. And even in the back uh, during that incident, there was even birds that came into the cabin of the aircraft. So you know, it's a good idea to have them down all the time when you're in flight. Um, all, all equipment will be secured in flight. And... Basically, we want to keep our equipment inside and accessible for the stuff we need. That's a little bit more on the operational side as far as having accessible, um, so, you know, especially for something we might need to take care of the patient. But it needs to be secure. So that doesn't mean as we slide the patient and we leave the monitor on the floor just because it's easier. No, we put it in its commercial mount. Um, the same thing with the ventilator. I know the ventilator in the BK right now, we're still strapping it down, but otherwise it belongs in its commercial mount. And to go along with that, you need to keep that in mind when you're packaging your patient. So as you're starting here at Medevac, you'll learn that 
your vent tubing, your monitor cables, your IV lines, all that stuff. You're going to want to keep out of the, you know, away from your straps and not strap it down. You know, the actual strap or your tubing and your lines just so you can properly mount your equipment in the aircraft as you slide the patient in. Um, all medic medical crew members wear appropriately company provided long sleeve Nomex flight suits with black leather boots while on flight or on a mission. And it's a safety thing and it's also a canes thing too for accreditation. Um, the flight suits will have some reflective striping on it, they'll be provided that way. Um, it's also encouraged that a flight crew wear Nomex gloves or equivalent when practical during flight. So there are times where you know, the risk of getting something from a patient is more than a fire because there's always, you know, we always have to you know, use our universal precautions, but maybe we're not doing direct patient care or we're not doing much for the patient. You should have your Nomex gloves on um, when practical during flight. And there are some other um, types of gloves that are just as good as Nomex and serve the same purpose. A lot of them are like a Kevlar leather mix now or a Kevlar Nomex mix, and that's fine. That's why we have the equivalent in there. Um, all flight crew members wear uh, eye and ear protection when around running aircraft. So sometimes we might be helping unload somebody else's aircraft, especially if we're assigned to the ambulance. That means if we're coming out and the aircraft is running, we should have some eye protection, ear protection on. Um, company provided vests, a safety vests that's been so become so popular in the last five or six years will be worn. You know, with reflective striping, will be worn by the medical crew members when on a public road or a private road that has public access. So if we land on the highway, for example, we really need to have those vests on. Uh, we probably have some room for improvement with that, um, but we really need to have those vests on. And the same goes on when we're on the ground, but right now we're just talking about the air. So if, if you're landing on the road or maybe it's a turnaround like at a truck stop or something like that, that has immediate access to the road, those, those vests should be on. Um, the medical flight crew members and specialty members will receive annual safety training as per the air service provider and LVH and medevac policy. So um, it's pretty much a given. We're regular flight crew on the aircraft. We're going to receive our training, our annual training, our ASAT training. You'll learn more about that um, as you go through orientation here. Um, there's the AMRAM training, which is usually just a once and done deal since it's reoccurring training that's done on a computer with their methods. And that's usually every quarter we have that training that we have to do. Um, some of our specialty teams that fly with us on a fairly regular basis or that can be expected to fly with us on occasion, they need to have some training too. They don't have the same amount we do, but they get a little more at least than the, than the standard uh, passenger briefing. So once a year, they kind of get, I believe it's once a year, they get signed, their companies, competency gets signed off for the aircraft. And, you know, they get some, some ASAT training and get a chance to go through things on the aircraft. Uh, medical crew members have the responsibility to terminate a flight if the patient's needs cannot be met due to illness of the medical crew, medical equipment problems, or perceived threat to the well-being of those on board. So not only do we have the right as a medical crew member to terminate a flight, like if we're on the way out to something and one of the crew members are sick, um, our monitor's not working, our vent's not working, um, it's not only our right to terminate that flight, that's our responsibility. So um, it's taken pretty seriously. We just don't say, oh, we're going to wing it, so-and-so's puking in a can even before we get to the referring hospital, and we'll be okay. I can keep an eye on the patient. No, everybody needs to be good to go, and the equipment also. Um, the pilot command will not be informed of the patient's age or conditioner, or excuse me, condition by the dispatchers or medical crew members prior to making a, a go, no-go decision. So our dispatchers, whether it's from our comm center here or with aircon through our methods, they pretty much know that. They're going to give the pilot, say it's either going to be a scene, an inner facility, an approximate location, and that's all the information they're going to give the pilot. So they say, yes, I can take the flight, and if they decline it, they really shouldn't be giving the pilot any more information. 
Once the pilot accepts it, he knows that the aircraft is in good shape, the weather is in good shape, the crew looks like they're in good shape. You know, aviation-wise, we're good to go for it. Um, then Aircom will give the rest of the give the rest of the information to us, or dispatchers. Um, when the part where it comes in for the medical crew, a lot of the bases will have their scanner on, especially during the day and sometimes at night, and they'll be listening, and they'll know we're going to get a request a few minutes before we actually get it, just from hearing there's a bad wreck on the highway, whatever, you know, involving a busload of kids or whatever. They shouldn't be running to the pilot saying, oh, man, there's a really bad wreck that involves a bunch of kids because we don't want the pilot to make that decision based on that. The pilot should be making a decision very objectively just based on aviation issues and weather issues, that type of thing. Um, it might be okay to say, hey, you know what, we're, we're going to get a scene request in this county probably in a few minutes just to give you a heads up. I'll give the pilot a chance to, you know, maybe check the weather in the area, especially if things, if the weather is not the best at the time or if there's some issues with the aircraft or something like that. And it'll give them some time to plan, you know, a little more time to plan for it. But we shouldn't be giving them any more information than AirCom would give them, which is just basically the location. You know, is it a scene? Is it an inner facility? And, you know, shouldn't you mention that it's an accident, a gunshot, a kid, or anything like that? No medical information for the pilots, you know, they should be hearing about till they accept the mission. Um, caution must always be exercised around the aircraft. Um, we want to make sure we don't damage any antennas, the pitot tubes, blades, doors. Um, be careful not to force an item shut if it doesn't close or open easily. Um, if we break something on the aircraft, even for something stupid, like an, I don't want to say stupid, but something that does not seem of consequence, we break anything on it while we're closing it up or getting ready to go, or even at a senior, God forbid we break something, we're out of service to the mechanic signs it off. And most of the time for a mechanic to sign it off, they're going to have to physically see it. That's just the way it is. And so we need to be careful. We need to be careful for the people that are working with us, like, a, like uh, the fire department, security at a hospital, um, other EMS people. Um, you need to keep an eye out for those people. So it's just not a safety thing. It's an operational thing. You know, it'd be really bad. We get there. It took us a while to get there. We get the patient loaded up. We're closing things up now. We break a door break a handle, snap an antenna off because we, we bumped our heads on it or something like that on, under the tail boom. Well, now we're out of service. Now we have to take the patient out, get another aircraft, get an ambulance, whatever. We don't want to, we want to try not to put ourselves in that position. Uh, going to 17, uh, seems like common sense, but we don't want to lift anything higher than our head when operating around the aircraft. With the aircraft we have, we pretty much can walk around the main rotor blades um, without having to duck. That's not the same for all air medical aircraft, but the ones we currently have, we're pretty safe around them as long as we stay away from the tail rotor. But um, what goes along with this is we, don't, we never, ever, ever want to place anything on the skids. And that includes when we're checking the aircraft, that shift change. Sometimes, you know, it, it's tempting to put an ice pack on the skid. Or maybe while we're loading a patient up, we'll throw the pump bag on the skid or something like that. We never, ever, even if we're sitting back at the base and if the weather is bad, whatever, put anything on the skids. Put it on the ground. Either put it on the floor of the aircraft, if you have to set it somewhere for a couple minutes, or put it on the ground. Because sure enough, we'll forget about it, even something as simple as one of those hard ice packs. And 12 hours later, when the aircraft is taking off, you know, it ends up hitting somebody or goes through somebody's windshield or something like that. Um, just get in the habit if you do it all the time, never putting anything on the skids. Um, hopefully you'll remember it all the time then. Um, only the flight crew and the mechanics are approved to operate the doors in the aircraft. So we don't want the firemen at a scene operating the doors on the aircraft. Unless there's a real problem, unless we're all incapacitated, then, of course, all bets are off. They can tear it apart to get us out. But pretty much, we should be the only ones operating the doors because, once again, our doors are different than, an ammo, than the doors on an ammo or a fire truck or just a regular door on a building or something like that. They're very easy to break off, especially if they're just misaligned a little, um, some adjustments not completely right, or just not being familiar with it. It's very easy to break a door. If we break a door at a scene, we're done. 
That means the patient's got to come out, and now we got to get another aircraft ambulance or whatever. So we don't want people operating our doors. Only we're supposed to be doing that. If we have somebody riding along with us, even a, re a resident physician, somebody's riding with us a whole shift, they really shouldn't be operating the doors, you know, and playing accordingly. You know, maybe they get in the back first, and the medical crew member's the last one to enter the cabin for the, uh, if they're riding in the back on the way out, and that way they can close the door. Um, when there's dual controls in, installed in the aircraft, which means there's both seats up front will have dual controls in front of them, which isn't that often. Um, maybe that's something you need to talk about at the beginning of the shift. You know, say, you know what, we're going to have duels in today. We're not going to take any parents, especially in our EC 135s. Our BK that we have right now, we could take a parent in the back, and that's not a problem. If we have a parent in the EC 135 with only two seats normally in the back, you know, maybe we all say in the beginning of the day, you know what, we're not going to take any parents. In fact, I think that's um, one of our newest additions to this document is that we won't. But also, even for a two-patient flight, if we have duels in, maybe we don't want to do that because now we have to strap equipment in the front seat. And just by the slightest chance, that seatbelt would come loose or it wasn't fastened correctly, and now you have some of your equipment up against a cyclic or the, what some people call the joystick up front, and now the pilot can't control the aircraft because of a piece of equipment got loose. Um, so we don't want to obviously put you know, risk putting ourselves in that position. So when there's duels in the aircraft, I guess the long and the short of it is, that's something you probably should be discussing as a crew with the pilot at the beginning of the shift. You know, what are we going to do and what aren't we going to do, more importantly. Uh, medical crew members are expected to stay alert in all legs of the flight. This is pretty much from the Air Methods GOM to help the, the pilot and command stay alert. I'm hoping they don't need us to stay, al stay alert, but regardless, we should be staying alert and just kind of keeping an eye on things, you know, especially, you know, if we're in a busy area or, you know, it's night out, that type of stuff. Um, the patient will be secured to the stretcher with the air service provider approved straps specific to that uh, particular stretcher. So if our straps don't fit because the patient's that big, one, we might not get them in the aircraft. Two, even if we can, we're not going to take them. Um, it's unfortunate if that happens, especially once we get there. But we're just, we, if we can't fasten our straps, we can't take the patient. If the patient weighs less than 40 pounds or 18 kilograms, an appropriate restraint device for weight and height will be used and secured to the litter. So right now, most of the time, that's a PD mate. Um, we have the other, um, the other device. And probably a good idea to document that in the chart also. Um, I know it's not really part of the safety, the whole safety thing, but um, if the kid's less than 40 pounds, we need to be using, at the very least, a PD mate. Uh, patient size, uh, we already kind of mentioned this. If patient size prohibits securing all required safety belts, the patient cannot be transported by that litter and will require alternative means of transportation. If, if it's the aircraft litter, the straps are pretty much the same on all ours, whether it's the BK or the 135. There's some patients we can fit in the BK that we can't fit in the 135 because of their girth, but if they can't make it because of the straps, then they pretty much can't go in our aircraft. Um, a smooth mover or device that is meant to be used only as a patient transfer device between beds is to be only used for those purposes. So we can't put one of those hard plastic smooth movers under the patient and then take them to the next hospital, for example. That's just not allowed, and it's not safe. Um, whenever it's prudent at an unsecured landing zone, and that's going to be a crew decision along with the pilot, uh, the medical crew member should post outside the rotor disc in view of the, of the pilot. And this is to make, to make sure that the area remains secure and that nobody's approaching the aircraft um, while the aircraft is starting up, or even while it's running um, until it shuts down. <clears throat> or until you're, you're, you're pretty sure that the fire department there, for example, has a good eye on things, and you, you know, you're sure that there's not going to be by approaching the aircraft um, from the sides or the back or even the front. Um, sometimes an alternative will do to this. The medical crew member will just stand outside the door uh, maintaining ICS contact with the pick. Maybe if they're just going to do a quick look-see, you know, step out a little bit, 
say, okay, there's fences all around us. We're actually good. Are we good to go? Everybody decides, yep, we're good. And then, you know, proceed to the ambulance wherever the patient is. Um, sterile cockpit is maintained during the critical phases of flight. Um, the critical phases of flight include all ground operations involving taxi, takeoff, and landing, and all other flight operations conducted uh, below 10,000 feet. Uh, I'm going to tell you here at Lehigh Valley Medevac, um, we're always below 10,000 feet. Um, the highest I've been, you know, working here has been about 7,500 feet with, with the helicopter. Um, so there is that caveat, except cruise flight. So essentially, once we're straight and level, we're at our cruising altitude, then the sterile cockpit thing is relaxed. Um, do we expect everybody not to say a word the entire flight, you know, just to be extra safe? No, that would be silly. And for everybody to be on, quote, edge all that time, um, I think it would kind of defeat the purpose. But when we're taking off, we're landing, you know, we're climbing to our altitude, we're starting to descend, we're hovering at one of the airports or one of the, you know, hospital pads. Um, really people, everybody really needs to be quiet unless there's something really going on that you need to tell the pilot or unless you're answering the pilot to say, hey, are we clear on the left-hand side? Yes, we are clear on the left-hand side. Um, otherwise, um, we really should be quiet. And I think there's always a little room for improvement for that. It's gotten a lot better over the years. But the straw cockpit, um, just really what you need to do. If there are things you need to do to take care of the patient, the pilots understand, they can even cut us out if they need to. But otherwise, you know, at least make an attempt, um, even to keep the patient care to you know, conversations to a minimum, um, you know, while we're on our final, for example. Medic, uh, medical crew will comply with the policy and use of MVGs accordance, according to their medical provider's policy. In addition, when MVGs are in use, it's expected that each medical crew member current with MVGs, that means their training's current, and they're, they're current to wear them and utilize them, will attach and utilize the MVGs as applicable. In cases where there's only one set of MVGs or night vision goggles for medical crew use, like let's say there's only two sets for the base, and the pilot has the one set and only one medical crew member is going to be wearing goggles, they should be, that person that's wearing the goggles should be in the front seat when they're on a non-patient uh, leg on, of, of the flight. So if there's only one set available for the nurse and the medic, whoever has it, they should be sitting up front when there's no patient they really shouldn't be sitting in the back with them. That kind of defeats the whole purpose, you know, especially on the way out to a scene, but we pretty much put it in writing. There's only two sets available. When there's somebody occupying the front seat, they should be the ones wearing the goggles. Um, medical crew are supposed to avoid uh, conversation or other distraction with maintenance staff, mechanics who are working on the aircraft, or even just aircraft parts or components. Um, this was one that was added um, since we started with this whole general safety document. So when they're out working on the aircraft, even doing their daily, and that even goes for the pilot, their daily inspection that they'll do, um, we really shouldn't be shooting the bull with them. We should let them alone and not distract them, not be blasting the radio if it's inside the hangar, you know, asking them how their weekend went, how their date went, how much they, you know, whatever over the weekend. Um, we really need to be not distracting those folks. Um, there's been some maintenance accidents, you know, in the industry, not so much with us, but that have come, you know, the root cause has come back to being, you know, the mechanic was distracted while they're putting something together. So you throw on their workbench in the hangar, for example, and they're working on maybe some engine part or maybe, you know, some part of the aircraft. Again, that's another time we shouldn't be distracting them. Um, family and friends of patients being transported in the aircraft with dual controls installed um, will not be able to occupy the co-pilot seat. So when the duels are in, we don't put a ride-along family member. Um, that's, that's a hard, fast rule now with our program. Um, you know, we talked to the people from Air Methods, our, our lead pilot for the program, and he said that's fine. And um, so when we're in our, the 135s, at least the way we have them configured now, 
we're doing an inner facility transfer for example and they say mom wants to ride along we just pretty much have to say no we can't we have our duals in our dual controls in the front of the aircraft that's the only place they can sit we don't allow um, ride along family members to sit there when the duals are are uh, installed we just have no idea about those people it's all I some people would already believe it's the risk just taking them even when things are lined up just perfect when the duals are in and they seem calm and everything else but when the dual controls are in they don't go um, the BK it's a little bit different story if we can find room for them in the back which we usually can then they can ride in the back if, if the crew agrees to that um, and this is something I was just added um, just a few months ago before this presentation any privately owned child seat utilized with LVH medevac aircraft must conform to uh, applicable motor vehicle standards and have on it in red letters the following statement this restraint is certified for use in motor vehicles and aircraft if it doesn't have that sticker on the back of it we cannot use it to transport the patient now a lot of times if, if that if that kid needs to fly we're probably going to want them on either on the litter or with at least a PD made or some other type of uh, pediatric device because we're going to need access to that kid sometimes on our ground trucks and it is worded a little different for there what we can use as far as a privately owned car seat um, it's a little bit more relaxed and maybe those patients their acuity isn't as high so most of the time we're not going to as a take you know be taking you know an infant in a car seat in the aircraft um, just something to keep in mind but if we decide to maybe we're bringing along because we're at an accident scene we're just pretty much taking them for the ride or maybe as a second patient because they were in the car we want to keep them with their parent then you know, I could see maybe we would use their own car seat if it meets the criteria but if that car seat's been in an accident for example we don't want to take it you know if, from the kid that was in the car seat that was, the car was just involved in the heavy duty accident well that car seat should be out of service anyhow so it's probably on the aircraft that's few and far in between that we would think it would be a good idea to use somebody's car seat to begin with and this is just as in our rule this is actually in the air methods uh, GON or GOM or the general operations manual and that's just kind of the way it is it's one of their rules and we just carried it forward to here so everybody's aware of it um, this has just kind of been put together in the past year or so uh, from the time of this presentation we've been doing our our ground service now with our, our critical care trucks just for two years and we came up with a completely separate document we we're trying to mash it into one generic document but we found it was just better if we had a separate one for the ground service it's very similar though Um, number one the operator the vehicle operator the driver of the vehicle has the final authority for the safety and selection of parking positioning of the ambulance continuing or canceling of a well, that needs to be reworded a little bit you know of the ground run due to weather um, you know as far as loading the equipment because they're more familiar with it um, than the rest of the medical crew and the operation of the vehicle um, but the same rationale we can one of us can say no as far as continuing with the mission when we're on the ground so anybody on the crew can say no um, there has to be some justification and we'll get a little more into that but um, with our risk assessment as far as the ground but any, any of us can say no even on the ground trucks um, at the very least the operator driver assigned to the to the mission will perform a safety walk around prior to departing the area so we load up a patient they should be looking down both sides of the vehicle in front of the vehicle before they just jump it in and throw it and drive and go uh, make sure we didn't leave a piece of equipment laying around make sure nothing ended up you know right low in front of the vehicle um, the medical crew members will assist in observing for traffic and generally observing and reporting possible hazards during a mission um, while the crew is not busy with the patient um, medical crew will remain strapped in the seat belts when, while patient conditions allow for it. Uh, once the vehicle comes to a complete stop or the vehicle has been placed in the park, the crew may exit the vehicle. 
So don't get out of the vehicle until you, you at least hear it's in park. I know it's hard for us to communicate directly with the driver, but make sure it's in park before we're opening doors and trying to get out and getting out of our seatbelts. Um, all equipment is supposed to be secured in a vehicle in motion. All unused equipment will be stowed away properly while in transit. All equipment required for patient care will be secured in amounts the patient, as patient condition allows. In other words, the monitor, the ventilator, the extra drug bag, whatever, all needs to be in its spot. We have the commercial mounts for like the modern ventilator, for example, that's where it needs to be. We don't just hook it on the edge of the stretcher while the thing's in motion. And we don't really put it even on that tray that we use if we have a bunch of stuff. It needs to be in its mount. Um, we talked about um, where appropriately uh, provided long sleeve Nomex or the poly cotton flight suits with black leather boots on a mission. And there'll also be reflective striping. So it's very similar to the aircraft. We're all gonna be pretty much dressed the same, except that um, for the ground service, we can actually wear um, the cotton, the polyester cotton flight suits, but they have to be company provided. We're still required to wear the black leather boots. And that's kind of a Kames thing too. Um, the safety vest for the reflective safety vest, if we're out on a road or a private road that has, a, it's right next to the road, um, we should have our, our, our safety reflective vest on. So if we're called to help out an accident scene or you know, along those lines, we're out on the road, we need to have those vests on. Um, the crew members, everybody has, is gonna have ground safety training every year, annual training and initial training, and people that go with us on a regular basis will at least get some uh, familiarization with our ambulances. Um, medical crew members have the responsibility to terminate a mission if the patient's needs cannot be met. Same as with the air. If somebody's really sick on your crew, you know what, somebody should be pulling the plug and saying, you know, we're not proceeding. We need, we operate as a team, all the team members need to be good. If we have medical equipment problems, say, oh, our monitor is not working, but we're real close to the hospital, we're supposed to be picking up, we shouldn't be picking up that patient. I, I just use that as an example. Um, you know, if the truck's not working right, we shouldn't be picking up the patient. So it's not only our right to say, you know, we should be terminating a mission if things aren't right. That's our responsibility to do that. <clears throat> um, similar to the aircraft, caution must be exercised when, when working around the ambulance. Um, you know, we don't want to damage anything, doors, mirrors. Uh, we don't want to force anything. You know, if we break a door or something like that, or a latch, that maybe we can't close the door right well, we can't really take off. You know, we really can't, you know, continue on. Um, and very similar to, we said don't put anything on the skids of the aircraft. We don't want to put anything on the bumper. Um, it should be caught, uh, you know, especially as the vehicle operator kind of does their walk around but it'd probably be a little bit less consequence if we just leave it on the ground and forget it. Chances are the pump bag will still be there when we go back together or somebody from the referring hospital will grab it and call up our comm center and say, hey, you guys left your pump bag, you know, sitting by our ambulance entrance. Use it, use it as an example. Then if we drive down the road and a mile later the pump bag falls off, well now we have no idea where it's at and it's probably been run over by a tractor trailer or whatever. So. We want to use the same rationale. We don't want to put anything on the skid or the bumper, whatever vehicle we're in. We're better off if we have to, to get the patient loaded, whatever, put it on the ground. Hopefully we'll remember it there, but if we don't, it'll probably remain intact till we get back to it. Um, we expect people to stay alert in all legs of the transport, and especially, you know, if it's been a long shift, you know, especially you get into those bad times of the morning, you know, four or five, six o'clock in the morning, we want to make sure that we're operating the vehicle is staying alert. So at least one of the crew members, you know, should be kind of staying awake and making sure they're staying awake because it's only natural during those really uh, bad circadian rhythm times of the morning that, you know, it's hard to stay awake sometimes when you're on the road. The patient will be secured to the stretcher or the ground source provider with approved straps specific to that specific stretcher. So if we can't make them fit, with our straps um, that's on the litter, we have a problem. 
Um, we really shouldn't be taking that patient. Doesn't mean we break out the nine foot straps and do it that way. Um, and if we're gonna do something like that, we need to be talking to management first, you know, whoever's on call. So might mean we go back for the bariatric litter, but especially for these interfacility transfers, we should not be taking patients where we can't secure our, our litter straps. If the patient weighs less than 40 pounds, it's the same thing. We need to use the appropriate device and document that. Um, if patient size you know, prohibits the use of the required seatbelts, you know, there needs to be something alternative worked out, um, just as I mentioned before. Uh, same rule with the smooth mover. We can't take that hard plastic board under the patient, the one that's meant to be a smooth mover, and go from point A to point B with it. It's only meant to help slide the patient over. Um, patient belongings, probably should have put this on the air one too. Maybe we'll, next year we'll throw this in on the air side too, on the air uh, general safety document. Can be brought along at crew discretion, as long as it can be safely stored within the vehicle. So the amount of belongings is decided by the crew and shouldn't be something that compromises safety. So we're going to be able to load up somebody's jazzy in the back of our ammo? It's probably not. Maybe even taking their wheelchair, like if we're taking them back, you know, like a long-term vent patient that has a wheelchair with them. We're probably not going to be able to take that back and we're just going to have to tell the setting facility, you have to leave it here and make some other arrangements. We can do it. So. Um, we thought about putting a bag limit, but you know it might be three small bags, for example, or maybe two large bags is just too much. So it's up to the crew, but if they can't transport the items safely, then we don't take them. And it goes the same on the air side. Sometimes we take a bag or two in the aircraft, but if it gets to be too much, you know, we apologize, keep a smile on our face, and say sorry. You're going to have to make other arrangements for that. We can't take that in the aircraft or the ambulance. And here's where the difference for the uh, privately owned car seats comes into play. Um, they must be of appropriate size without signs of physical damage and in good working condition to be used for patient transport. And again, medical crews should you know, consider the patient acuity as part of the you know, decision when you, to use a privately owned car seat. So if you have a kid that's in severe respiratory distress that we're transporting across town back to, um, you know, back to Lehigh Valley Cedar Crest, for example, maybe we shouldn't put them on a car seat because we might need to manage their airway. Same token, we have a kid that's very comfortable and doesn't seem too much distress. That might actually be the safest thing to do is to put them in our car seat. It actually might be safer than even using our PD mate device. So, you know, there's judgment that goes along with it and just, you know, just be able to you know justify it, your decision. Um, we're still under the safety policy, still under the first pillar of SMS, but I promise it's going to go faster now. And it might not be extremely important for everybody that's being as annual training or even their initial uh, safety process training here at Medevac to remember everything I'm about to go through now word for word. I think the general safety documents are worthy of some review once in a while. Kind of some of the rest of this, you might not need to really memorize everything. So I, I did make mention of the uh, Air Methods GOM, or the General Operations Manual. You hear most people, you might hear the mechanical say, well, the GOM says this, or the pilot says, GOM says that. Um, this, this is what they're talking about. And it's it's, it's prepared by them, by buyer certificate holder, you know, the aviation certificate holder. It governs the operations of their, their flight department um, to assure the utmost of safety and provides what they call firm guidelines to enable all company personnel to carry out their assigned duties and responsibilities in accordance with company policies and FAA regulations. So if a pilot, for example, does something that kind of goes against the GOM, they can do that, but they really have to justify it. It almost has to be like under emergency conditions. So they say, you know what, I know the GOM says I'm supposed to do this procedure when I'm getting ready to land, but something wasn't working right and I had to do this. They got to be able to justify it. 
So anytime the GOM, the rules in the GOM or the guidance of the GOM gets busted, it's a pretty big deal. And it's almost, at least for the aviation folks, the same as an FAA regulation. So we at least need to be familiar with the concept of the GOM. And a lot of the general safety document comes out of the GOM. The manual is very lengthy. I think it's over 200 pages now. And as I mentioned, it's not necessary for medical crew to read the entire contents of the GOM. I, I'd say it's, a, it's not worth your time. Um, but there is a version of it on EMS charts that I actually went ahead and highlighted in yellow the sections that pertain to us. So that's a short read. You can read all the highlighted sections in about 10 minutes. And even on, uh, even on the opening pages, it, it's highlighted which sections of the GOM are highlighted that, that pertain to us. So just about everything you see is highlighted. You'll see in some type of training, you'll see in the general safety document, you'll see in some of our annual training, and you know, you'll hear parts of it in our shift briefs. So that part, you know, when you guys have a chance while you're being oriented, that's probably not a bad idea to look through the highlighted version of the GOM. Um, we do have it up in EMS charts or wherever our document uh, warehouse ends up landing. Um, as far as LVHN, the hospital network safety policies, this you can find under the environmental, excuse me, environment of care manual. That's the quote safety manual for the hospital network. Um, so that's where you want to look it up. It can be found on the LVHN intranet, which all the hospital employees have access to. And it's listed under the policy procedure section, which is listed under resources of the intranet the hospital intranet homepage. Finally, we're moving on to the second pillar of SMS, and that has to do with risk assessments. And it's a baseline number that we use at the beginning of a shift. And that's whether it's air or ground. We're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about our ground since Air Methods has their own, and we've actually come up with our own for the ground. It's a baseline number that may change throughout the shift, maybe not often, but occasionally it does. And it's based on a condition such as weather, time of day, a switch of crew, maybe a switch of vehicles because your vehicle broke down, you had to go into a backup, or you know, a longer pending trip might be times that we uh, change up our uh, ground risk assessment. So we actually use like a ground risk assessment matrix and then a worksheet that we actually write the numbers in, but there's like a guide from the matrix to complete the worksheet. Um, there's essentially, just for as a reference, um, 10 things we fill in. And actually for the start of this shift, I believe there's only seven or eight things, there's only seven things we have to fill in. And then if we have like a long trip or we go way over our shift or a winter storm watch goes to a winter storm warning, then it might change our ground risk assessment because it's based on the weather also. And then here's our matrix that we use to fill out that worksheet you just saw. So we talk about a full-time vehicle EMT operator. So if they've been working for us less than three times, yeah, excuse me, uh, less than six months as a full-time vehicle operator, they get we add points. If they work six to 12 mo uh, months with us full-time, then we might add just two points or less points. If they've been with us greater than two years, then they get a zero, and that's good. Um, a per diem that's filling in, we add points for that. So we know there's increased risk when we don't have one of our full-time people, and that's fine. So I think that's the per diem. We just want to realize that they may not be as familiar with the vehicle or some of the routes that we do or just with the way we operate. Um, our other staff filling in as a vehicle operator. So if one of our uh, nurses or medics are operating the vehicle, that's not their full-time job. That's pretty much the same as having a per diem person operate the vehicle or maybe even less qualified to operate the vehicle than a lot of our per diem EMTs. So they're not gonna be as familiar with driving that vehicle, the operation of that vehicle. So there's some increased risk when we're using what's normally one of our medics or nurses to drive the vehicle. Um, we add points, if the roads are pretty much impassable, that adds a lot of points. That takes us halfway to having to call somebody before we can take a mission, as far as the points. 
Um, if they're just slippery roads, like maybe there's snow cover with a couple inches of snow, but they're somewhat passable if we go half the speed limit or something along those lines, adds a fair amount of points. Um, a heavy rain with this ponding on the roadways, that adds you know, less points maybe than the snow. And then maybe just some rain or drizzle, that adds just a few points. Um, adverse weather warnings. So let's say there's a tornado warning or a winter weather warning that you get a fair amount of points for that. If it's just an active weather watch, like a winter storm watch, a tornado watch or something, we'll actually add some points for that. And it's just a weather advisory, just saying, yeah, there might be some localized flooding or something like that. Um, you know, we add, we add some points for that. Maybe not as much if there's a warning. We're saying, well, what, what do these rain things have to do? You know, why are we adding so many points for that when it's just, you know, it can't be as bad as the snow? Because it kind of makes us look at, you know, maybe even our route might even be flooded for where we're going. You know, if we're driving up to Harrisburg or Schuylkill County or somewhere in New Jersey or something, um, you know, we might even have to replan our driving route if there's active warnings out there. So that's why we added those points, just to get people to think about it. Um, and then we have some... Oh, visibility, if it's fog, report less than a half mile, we add a few points. If it's just rain and snow, impairing our visibility a little bit, then that's just a couple of points. If it's night, operating after sunset, we can, we add a few points for that. Um, the road type, if it's the start of the shift, we don't worry about it. Um, if it's going to be a longer trip, that's when we start adding points. If it's going to be all highway or whatever, or more than 50% of the trip is just, you know, guesstimated to be highway, um, we don't add any points. But if it's not, for other roads, we'll actually start to add some points. Uh, the distance for every trip that goes over a 50 round trip, we add another point for every 50 miles. Um, for each 30 minute period, we go past the end of the shift of a 12 hour shift, we add a point. So if we're going to take a trip down to Philly and it's 6 o'clock and you're supposed to be off at 7, you know, we might end up adding 4 or 5 points to our risk assessment just for that. Crew rest. We where we have have to trust the crew members what they're saying. If they got less than eight hours of rest, but it's greater than six, you know, we just add a couple points. If it's less than six hours rest before the beginning of the shift, um, you know, we want people to be honest. It doesn't even identify whether it was the medic or the nurse, for example. But just, you know, what, if that's the case, that's what you should be doing. Um, for each qualified member of the crew, vehicle operator crew, like if you're a medic, and nurse are qualified vehicle operators and they're on a crew, we actually take some points off because we consider that a bonus. That means our EMT vehicle operator gets before o'clock in the morning, they've been driving most of the shift and they're tired on a deadhead leg when we don't have a patient coming back from Philly or New York or something like that. They can easily turn to one of those people and say, you know what, I'm really beat, my eyes are getting heavy or my legs are getting jumpy, whatever can you drive back to the hospital for me or drive back to the base for me? That's actually a good thing that we have that capability. Um, if we're using a backup truck and it's one of our own trucks, we add a couple points for that. If we're borrowing a truck from somebody else, we're using somebody, you know, one of the services that we partner with or one of the part services we work with to, to borrow trucks from them during our times of vehicle needs, we add even more points because we're not familiar with those vehicles. And, you know, for mission specific, um, it's not, you actually, a crew member can actually decline even if we don't get to the magic number of 30. And 30 is the number, if all those points add up to 30, we need to call whoever the leadership on call is and say, hey, we got this, we got our risk assessment 32, we feel pretty good about taking it, what do you think? Or, hey, we came up with a risk assessment of 35. We're not feeling real good about this, but maybe in a couple hours, the roads are going to clear. It is getting warmer. The ice is going to melt or whatever, or it's going to be daylight. We'll have a better idea what's going on with the flooding or whatever. You know, maybe we could do that, or maybe we need to get somebody else to do it. Um, but regardless, whether you turn down a mission because of your height, 
high risk assessment goes over that 30 or under, you got to call the leadership person. You can do it through the comm center if you need to, but there needs to be a conversation. Like I said, if it's 30 or above, you need to make that phone call. But regardless, if you turn it down, that phone call needs to be made. It doesn't mean the crew's in trouble. That's not what it means at all. It just means what can we do? You know, is there a way that we can mitigate some of these risks where it would be acceptable to take this mission? Or maybe we just need to say no. Maybe we need to put it on delay. Maybe we need to have somebody else do it. Um, but that conversation needs to take place. Just saying no isn't a free pass just to say, you know, I don't want to go there. Um, whoever's on call needs, needs to be aware of it and there needs to be a conversation. <clears throat> oh, I just uh, kind of already beat that dead horse about declining a mission. Um, you know, alternatives can be discussed, for example, how to lower your, you know, how to mitigate some of those risks or, you know, waiting something out or, you know, getting somebody else to do it maybe. Um, the aviation risk assessment, I didn't bother. We're not going to go over that line by line like we did with the ground one. The pilots are responsible for that. They do it with the beginning of their shift. And they have to at least look at it for every mission they take. And some of the things, and this isn't an all-inclusive risk or a list of risk assessment, but what they look at, but um, some of the factors they do look at is the day-night conditions. Obviously, at night, their, their, number, their risk assessment number is going to be higher. Um, the terrain, if we're flying over mountainous terrain, which is most of the time, most of our flights, that adds some numbers. The length of the flight. If we're traveling 100 miles, it's going to be a higher risk assessment than a flight that may only be a 20-mile um, patient leg, loaded leg. Um, pilot experience at the base and, the, and that particular aircraft actually gets factored into their risk assessment. So when we have a new pilot, and you hear some higher than usual numbers, it doesn't mean anything's necessarily bad. It just means they don't have the quote time at that base yet, or maybe even with that airframe. Um, they even look at the medical crew experience. I don't think a lot of us realize that. Um, I know the old risk assessment that just went, out, went away a few months ago, they actually looked at the MVG experience of the crew. Um, yeah, they might not actually ask for how many hours, but there are times, you know, where the pilots will ask, hey, how long you've been with the program, whatever. Um, that does get factored in. Um, the current weather, the expected weather during our trip. If it's a longer trip, they really need to look ahead. So that's going to be factored in the aircraft if issues. If there's stuff that's on the list that maybe isn't working 100% on the aircraft, but it's still deemed safe to fly and airworthy, um, it still might add to the risk assessment value. Um, there's similar principles that apply to all risk assessments. Um, you want to help, these help to identify conditions that can lead to an increased risk or hazard. So, and regardless, there are certain cutoffs on these risk assessments where you need to contact a higher authority. Maybe they, for a pilot, they might need to uh, contact somebody at uh, operational control out in Denver before they take a mission if their risk assessment is that high. Uh, typically, they might just be turned down the mission at that point. If their risk assessment is that high, they have to make a phone call to get permission to go. Um, in most cases, it's probably not that flyable anyhow, to be really honest with you. Um, and it's just not, you know, passing the buck for higher authority before we go out, you know, even for a ground run. Um, we want to go, even if you're well under your, your, your no-go numbers, um, you want to look at a way to mitigate things. How can you mitigate risk that were identified through the risk assessment process? Um, maybe if we know there's a winter storm watch out there and it's going to be snowing icy in the truck you're in, the on-spot chains aren't working, uh, maybe you want to, you know, call up, you know, one of the bosses and say, or whoever's on call and say, you know what? It's supposed to be snowing tonight. How about if we switch into the backup truck that has the on-spot chains? So that would help mitigate that risk of the snow. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but just helps to mitigate it. I'll just use that as an example. So we're looking for ways to, you know, might actually lower our risk assessment numbers or may not actually lower the risk assessment numbers. 
Um, safety reporting is part of risk management. Risk management, again, being the second pillar of the whole SMS system. Um, safety reporting is just another avenue of identifying risk and hazards. I actually had this table. I hope you can see it here, but it's actually at every safety board um, at each base and also at our ground base. So we report safety issues through TAMA, and that's the Air Methods Multidisciplinary Application. It's an online thing we do after every mission. So if our skids leave the ground, if it's not a patient mission or we get turned around because the requester aborted us or whatever, um, we still fill out the TAM. And if there's any safety issues, come, we put them in there and they get addressed. Um, but we're taking ownership for that problem then too. Not saying the problem's our fault, but you know we're speaking up and it's the crew on that flight or even that ground run that said, hey, we had a problem or there was an issue. It doesn't mean anything bad ultimately happened, but we identified a hazard or a risk that's normally not there. There's the alert line. It used to be called the silent whistle. Some people still call it silent whistle. It's actually a program that Air Methods set up. Um, just a little background on it. It's not just for Air Methods employees. It's for anybody that works with Air Methods, like the medical crew here at the hospital. We're partnered up with them to provide the service. Um, we see something that's not right, but we don't feel comfortable, or maybe we reported it through the normal channels, and maybe we feel we didn't get the feedback we should have. Um, this is an avenue, and it's actually run by a separate company other than Air Methods. It's independently run. Air Methods, um, they say they don't have their hand in this, but it helped. But they'll go to Air Methods and say, hey, these guys at Lehigh are reporting a couple of them that, some, that this particular item is not safe or it's not being addressed or whatever. I'm just using an example. I'm not aware of any silent whistles that have come th through our program, but it is there. Um, and it's a way that you can anonymously, if you choose to, report safety concerns. It's also a line that can be used to report, if you, if you think there's some, something very unethical going on, they want to hear about it also through there. And the hotspot is a similar thing, too. Um, and it's even meant to be used by even customers of air methods, um, this alert line. So there are some uh, posters around about it. Um, it is on our safety board. The number's on it here, too, or you can go online. Um, special reports on the EMS charts. At the end of EMS charts, there are certain specific things that we go down a checklist to look at. And if we exceed those, whether it be like a cabin temperature or maybe a safety issue or whatever, that is a way that the medical crew can report things um, to the medevac leadership team. And even some of the air methods people will get copied on some of these emails um, on these special reports. Um, and then there's the patient safety reporting um, at medevac. and that can be directly to the management, maybe something that, you know, some, something that's not immediate can sometimes go like to the safety council. Um, and then also, used to be a patient safety icon on the uh, web SSO toolbar uh, for the hospital employees. Now it's a report, event reporting icon. And there's all types of safety things, even near misses or even if, you, even if your glucometer doesn't work and you can't get a blood sugar on your patient, that's, a, that's supposed to be a patient safety report. If you almost drop a patient out in the helipad, that should be, as, all, as well as your special report in EMS charts and the TAMR report, that should all, something along those lines. I'm not saying stuff like that goes on every day here, but if it would, um, that's something that should be reported through the hospital system off also under event reporting. So even the near misses, even like medication errors, stuff like that, you know, stuff that's strictly patient safety, not even just operational stuff, that needs to be reported. You know, we look at the whole thing. If it's not reported, it can't get fixed. And chances are, if we're reporting it, there's five other people that, that have done the same thing. So it really helps, you know, develop your, you know, see what the trends are. Uh, risk management, um, safety and risk management um, tools. This is the very short version of this. And I put a copy of a basic risk matrix as shown on the left. So 
what should be going on if we're going to start a new procedure, a new policy, or an operational change, we should be looking, we should be looking at a risk assessment uh, matrix. And it's real simply put, risk is really just a combination of probability and severity. So severity can be anywhere from catastrophic down to negligible. And then the probability, you know, is it frequent to happen? Is it frequently going to happen, the problem? Is it likely to happen? Occasionally going to happen? Seldom happen or unlikely to happen? So th there's always going to be risk in our job. Every time we get in the aircraft and take off, there's some risk. But it's going to be unlikely we're going to have a problem. But it could be a critical problem if we do have a problem, especially if we have a hard landing or something like that. So, but that would still be a low, for example, low risk. Um, but everything we do, and when we talk about the severity of the problem or the damage, um, some people will actually put catastrophic as severe injuries and anything above $10,000 worth of damage, for example. A critical problem might be like a moderate injury, like some broken bones, maybe $1,000 to $10,000 worth of damage. Um, those aren't the actual numbers, but that's how some people you will you know determine what's catastrophic, what's critical, what's marginal, what's negligible. But we you know we do want to look and the severity of the damage from an incident um, is the most likely damage that's going to happen if there is a problem, if part of the system fails. It's not what could, you know, what's necessarily the worst case, but what would likely happen, like if we drop the patient, or what would likely happen if there's a mechanical failure with the transmission or something. Yeah, I just use those as examples. So uh, basically what goes on when we look at a new procedure or a policy or something like that, we do look at the probability, or we should be looking at the probability and the severity of a problem if something does go wrong, and then we look for ways to mitigate it. So after we do all those mitigation strategies, like maybe to prevent from dropping a patient, re-education, whatever, we look at the residual risk, and that should lower our probability or even the severity of the problem after we employed our, um, our mitigation strategies. I hope that makes a little bit of sense what I said. So, you know, hopefully, you know, whether it be operations, management, the aviation folks, you know, they do look at stuff like this. Um, people from the Safety Council, some things come up, and, you know, we look at it, you know, try to identify the risk value, you know, as far as probability and severity. We try to find ways to mitigate it, and then we look at it again, maybe rescore it, and that's the residual risk, what's left over. And if the residual risk is too high for management, and they say, you know what, that's still too risky, then maybe we won't do that, for example. Safety assurance, we're on the third pillar, finally. It's going to go quick now. Um, it's a component of SMS that deals with evaluation of the continued effectiveness of the implemented risk control strategies and supports the process of identification of new risk. It's not really, identification of new risk isn't really part of safety assurance, but it supports the process of identifying all those tools we talked about kind of comes under safety assurance, the tools themselves. Um, so it's also important for safety assurance that there's feedback, whether it be from the people from our methods, the people from our management team, when there are things reported in TAMA, uh, the special reports. Um, that's part of safety assurance, or the third pillar of the, the whole SMS system. Um, other safety assurance tools used in our program is like the aircraft tracking. This is great. They, the, the dispatchers, the people at Aircom, need the people in operational control who are actual pilots, they could see where our aircraft are going. They could see actually the weather they're flying into. Or they could see how high the mountains are around them and see how our aircraft is. And they can actually get a hold of us and say, you know what, you guys are flying a little low for being in that high of an area. You know, what's going on? So they can actually contact us in flight. So I think that's all part of that safety assurance. And they can also review if somebody has a particular style of flying, making really hard turns, for example, or something along those lines. They can actually see that and track that. 
So that's all part of the safety assurance tools. We have a very similar thing on the ground where if they see um, vehicle operator A is constantly driving 90 miles an hour down to Philly, every time they do it, they can say, wow, that, that shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't even be happening once. But if they see a pattern, they can say, what's going on here? We need to, or if they see all the vehicle operators doing that, they need to really put the brakes on everybody, no pun intended, and say, you know what? You guys, everybody's just driving way too fast. We need to slow it down. We have the documentation here. And I think just operating the vehicle, knowing that they're tracking your speed and how fast you're slowing down, speeding up, that type of stuff, um, kind of gives you a little incentive maybe to drive it a little closer to the speed limit. And also, God forbid, something should happen. We break down and we're out of cell phone coverage and whatever. They should be able to tell where we're at. So that should be, that's some good safety assurance a good safety assurance tool there also. Uh, the cameras in the vehicles, uh, the cameras that are at the bases, like on the helicopters um, and the helipads here at Lehigh, that's actually a pretty good piece of assurance because they could tell if something's going on. Even with the vehicles outside one of the ERs, security in our comm center, or the security dispatcher could say, wow, these guys are really having a tough time with that patient, or the family member's coming up, now they're fighting with our crew. Um, you know, they can get, they can get the troops going to help us out. Um, if we have a problem on the helipad, or even a problem at the helipad at one of the bases, Aircom and our, actually our own comm center can see that and say, wow, it looks like, looks like they're having a problem with their aircraft. I'm gonna start getting help to them right now. We didn't always have that. We've really come a long way. So this camera thing, I know some people get a little paranoid about it and stuff like that. Um, I've been involved with some vehicle crashes with ambulances, not necessarily the vehicle operator. But most of the time, the cameras inside those vehicles that showed what was going on inside and outside those vehicles helped the crews, even from a legal point. Um, then there's the audits of the aircraft maintenance, base maintenance facilities, vehicle maintenance. That's all part of that safety assurance thing too. Um, it's a lot better if we could track our vehicle maintenance and somebody's keeping an eye on it than not especially if we do have a problem with the vehicle, a continued problem, one that should be identified and fixed. And if there is a problem with the vehicle, or let's say it becomes involved in a crash, we can show that the vehicle was in good operating order. Um, safety promotion, we're on, finally on that fourth pillar of the SMS system, one down here. Um, includes the training, communications, and other actions to promote a positive safety culture within all the staff of our program. So, and, it's what, and also, especially being in the transport environment with air and ground, it's how we interact with other people while we perform with our duties, such as our dispatchers and other communication specialists, or let's say from the counties. Um, we're interacting with them all the time, referring hospitals, referring EMS units, um, fire departments, police departments, security officers. They're all kind of part of the team, or we're all kind of part of the, you know, the big team and we have, to see, um, we have to promote some safety to all these people for them to be able to, you know, be able to work with them and for them to be able to work with us safely. Um, some of these safety promotion communications may be periodical as far as like the safety connect that comes from our methods or some of the things that are only um, distributed as needed, like when there's issues that come up, like the safety bulletin, safety notices, and safety alerts. Um, and those are updated and put on our base safety boards. And then there's also safety uh, promotion communications from the hospital network. Um, may come in newsletters, you know, more so online, but they go out to everybody. Um, the hospital passes on a lot of stuff. For example, um, the PA health uh, bulletins. That's something that comes out a lot, especially when it comes to uh, time, the virus time, or um, even with the Ebola stuff that comes out, or even just problems, even just generally in medical transportation. And then there's emails that we get from the hospital too when they identify problems. <clears throat> um, some of the safety promotion communications may actually come through our own website that people look on every day, like from the ambulances and fire departments or foreign hospitals, or even our Facebook page. Um, sources of safety training for the medevac crew include the CTS, which is the online safety training from Air Methods. Every quarter we have another batch of that to do. Um, initial air medical crew training provided by air methods, and that's usually done by our lead pilot. So when we have new people that come to the air crew, 
or at least Paul sits down with him for a day and goes over stuff. A lot more than what I'm doing here, actually. Um, initial and annual ground transport training. Uh, some people call it the ASAT training. We also have it for the ground, too. We want to make sure everybody can operate or at least work around our vehicles, whether it be air or ground, um, safely and effectively. Um, kind of what separates us apart from other organizations, um, we do a lot of safety training ourselves for other organizations. So some of the safety training that's actually provided not for medevac people, but by medevac crews includes uh, landing zone safety training for fire departments and other public safety agencies. We have a structured training program. We'll go out to fire departments, put on about a two hour presentation, bring the helicopter out, and you know we're actually providing that training and actually some continuing ed credit for it too. Um, something we've started in the past couple of years, we have formalized training um, for offload training for our ER uh, tech partners and LVH security officers, uh, mainly here at Lehigh Valley Cedar Crest. Uh, we have a busy helipad. They're the ones coming out to help us. We have a, we formalized uh, through the Safety Council and management a formal training program for them that gets done. I, I believe we're doing uh, redoing it every year. And once when one of the tech partners says well, you're going to be offloading helicopters. Um, they go through a formal training program with a presentation. And now in the past year, we started doing some uh, helicopter patient loading and offloading training for referring hospital security and other staff. So there's times we're picking up patients at other at referring hospitals. Some of them are our own. Some of them, a lot of them are out of the hospital network, out of the Lehigh Valley hospital network. And we're offering to go out, and we've done a couple now, uh, people from our safety council. We'll go out and train their security staff, or maybe their ER techs, or whoever wants to be trained. We'll actually go out, and, and we have a uh, training program specifically for them. And it's a good way to reach out, just generally speaking. In closing, uh, remember safety in the transport environment, whether it be air or ground, um, is more than just saying be safe. You know, being safe, what, you know, what does that really mean? Um, yeah, it's a good reminder, you know, we want to keep our wits about us. But, you know, safety really needs to be part of the process for everything we do and actually everything we plan at our program and hospital network. So one last time, you don't have to memorize it for now, but we're during accreditation days uh, when we're getting our inspections and stuff like that, sometimes the question comes up about SMS. Um, it's kind of the latest buzzword going out there. Um, I tried to make this whole presentation a little bit of a part of the lesson of SMS within our program. And the four pillars are, again, policy, safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. What every crew member really needs to know day to day, pretty much know the stuff that's on that general safety document and know how to report um, any risks that you see, you know, whether it's through the TAMA reports, EMS charts, you know, if it's something immediate, get a hold of the person on call. If there's something that needs to be addressed right away, address it right away. But, um, you know, it is non-punitive, you know, all these reporting structures, but that's what everybody here really needs to know. They, they, they need to know how we operate safely from an operational point of view, which is, you know, mostly in our general safety document. You know, pay attention during your, uh, your initial and reoccurring training, and just, you know, don't be afraid to report safety issues. And that's all I got. Thanks.